It was a plane that shattered the morale of its own pilots and at the same time became an adored workhorse. It neither fulfilled expectations nor did it disappoint. It was an honest bird designed with a purpose, accepting the sacrifices it was meant to make without complain. The British Harry Tate. Hello everybody and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host Bismarck and today we are having a look at the British RE-8, a World War I ground attack, light bomber and reconnaissance aircraft. Let's go over her story and then hop inside the one found here at the RAF Museum in London to see how she works. Throughout the First World War, the British Royal Aircraft Factory provided the British with a plethora of two-seater reconnaissance and ground attack aircraft. The RE-8, as its name implies, is the eighth design in the RE catalog, standing for reconnaissance, experimental, giving away the main role of this aircraft. Reconnaissance planes don't attract as much well, attention as fighter planes, but in World War I they provided a critical role in giving each side eyes in the sky that would be able to gauge enemy strength on the ground, direct artillery fire, or even harass ground troops. This made them a target of fighter aircraft and heavy AA fire, as it was obviously in everyone's interest to blind their adversary as much as possible. The most effective way to do this was to shoot down as many reconnaissance aircraft as possible. In 1915, the RFC set down requirements for future reconnaissance aircraft. This was met with various designs by the Royal Aircraft Factory in drawn form. The design would go through various transitions, but the essentials stayed the same. The four-bladed propeller, the standardized two-seater configuration with one pilot and one observer, as well as provisions for wireless Morse transmissions and offensive and defensive armament. The observer in the back was also given some uh, rudimentary control of the aircraft in case of need. Offensive firepower was to be provided by in internal single Lewis gun shooting through the propeller arc. In absence of a working interrupter system, the air screw was to be protected by metal deflectors. A working but suboptimal system for the time uh, for the Allies. Defensive firepower was meant to be a single machine gun operated on a rotating platform by the observer. This weapon configuration stands out in 1916. The RE-8 design was not the first two-seater to feature both offensive and defensive armament, but it was among the first, showing how the early experiences and the escalation in the air war started to influence design requirements. The RE-8 was a bit of a non-conformist in that it had ties to the previous RE-type aircraft in name only. Its design features resemble more closely the BE-2, also from the Royal Aircraft Factory, with a few tweaks here and there. Two prototypes were tested in June and July 1916, both at home in Britain, and although they flew no combat sorties in France by operational RFC pilots, the result was a mixed bag. The aircraft was fine to fly, but nearly every pilot complained about heavy handling as well as various details, for example in relation to the weaponry or its responsiveness at low speeds. The RFC crews took the initiative to make various modifications themselves and finally submitted multiple reports with all the changes they would like to see done. That must have proven a bit too depressing of a read since it was virtually ignored as the first production RE-8s were put on order. It serves mentioning that the RE-8's production order was under threat at this time, uh, as comparison trials against other designs left it outperformed. It seems that the RE-8 was saved by bureaucratic enthusiasm, the pressing need for new aircraft and the limitations of engine production. It would indeed be too much to say that the Royal Aircraft Factory simply neglected the design issues and decided to simply move fast and break things, but at the same time the RE-8 would cause quite an upset amongst the ranks. By September 1916 about 1,200 RE-8s had been ordered. The magnitude of this order could be contributed to the fact that the RFC was under scrutiny of the lack of modern aircraft in their arsenal, a deficiency they wanted of course to close as quickly as possible. An initial batch of 50 was produced by the Royal Aircraft Factory itself, who thus provided the first combat operational RE-8s in November 1916 to number 52 squadron. Whereas the initial tests with the prototypes had not been a flowery procedure, 
The Royal Flying Corps pilots had known that it was an aircraft in testing and they thus got it some slack. But now, a few months later, a virtually identical production variant showed up on their doorstep and the reception was a lot less reserved. The aircraft was reported to have a tendency to spin unrecoverably with little warning and was involved in, well, various fatal accidents. It quickly developed an unflattering reputation that spread. During that time, the RE-8 also scored its first kill. Nope. Not a German, but number 52 squadron's morale. Following the troubles it had with this aircraft, morale hit rock bottom to the point where the squadron actually had to exchange all their aircraft with another unit, number 34 squadron, in order to stay combat effective. What is interesting is that number 34 squadron, whom exchanged their older BE-2s for the new RE-8s, they were actually happy with the switch. What impressed them on the aircraft was on the one hand the offensive firepower, now upgraded with actually an interrupter gear instead of the deflector plate, and the defensive turret, a luxury they had not yet experienced. Additionally, they really got a kick out of the performance they now had under their uh, shoes with their new kite. Nevertheless, the Royal Aircraft Factory had its work cut out for it. After most criticism had been ignored for the initial production run, it now had to get to work to remedy the most obvious flaws of the aircraft. In this they were, well, much behind. They changed and rechanged the control surfaces, the tail fin sizes, as well as the angle and the position of the engine. It was only by April 1917, five months after the production versions had started to roll out of the factories, that the first modified aircraft were being tested. The company came to the following conclusions. The accidents originated from bad handling and bad handling arises from pilot error due to inadequate training. There is credence to this interpretation since number 52 squadron had indeed been a young squadron while number 34 had plenty of experience to share. However, the incident also highlighted the deficiencies in Royal Flying Corps pilot training uh, that did not adequately prepare pilots for the new aircraft. Beyond these issues, however, there was still the mediocre RE-8 with its heavy stick handling, sensitive rudder and volatile kicks at low speeds. Additionally, the uh, Challenger's, uh, Vickers Challenger interrupting gear proved to be of a dubious character with failures being a consistent company of any pilot and it was replaced with the Constantinesco system in mid-1917. The Vickers gun was also moved to the outside of the fuselage as had been suggested by some pilots all along. By this point, the unstable undercarriage had also been replaced. A whole other list of possible modifications, including engine upgrades, were proposed and tested, but only the most pressing issues, such as the larger dorsal and ventral fins, were actually added. However, the cowling here that we see was also changed multiple times. The RE-8's problems were a mixed bag. The design itself wasn't a home run, but it flagged up an issue that the RFC could not ignore pilot inexperience. Pilots with many hours under their belt liked her, commenting that she was well cozy and comfortable, lovely to fly and would do anything asked of it up to its limited ability. Well, I guess that passes as endorsements in these parts of the world. Anyway, for new pilots, well, that story was very different. With only a few hours of flight time under their belt before being sent off to the front, they were not prepared for an aircraft like this. The combination of a heavy stick, sensitive rudder, limited acceleration and slow speed characteristics caused plenty of grief. Evidence to this is the already aforementioned number 52 squadron. However, number 34 squadron on the other hand was in a chipper. But they were more experienced and even they realized that the RA hate could be unforgiving. One major in number 34 squadron wrote a small guidance handbook for new pilots converting to this type of aircraft. Practical advice included, amongst others, not to use the aircraft in a slow guide and to instruct the observer to sit as low as possible on takeoff and landing so as not to increase wind resistance. Better training, guidance from more experienced pilots and a few modifications here and there proved enough to make the RE-8 into a Royal Flying Corps workhorse. More and more squadrons converted to her. By June 1917, 15 out of 25 reconnaissance squadrons were equipped with this type of aircraft. They now started to affectionately call the Harry Tate, after a stage performer of the time whose name rhymed with the aircraft's designation. 
The RE8 has a length of 8.5 meters and an upper span of 12.9 and a lower span of 9.9 meters and she stands at 3.5 meters of height. The 140 to 150 horsepower REF 4A air-cooled V12 engine gave it a maximum speed of 98 miles an hour and it has an endurance of around 4 hours of flight time. Now the standard armament consisted of one single 303 machine gun synchronized with the CC fire control interrupter and a single or twin 303 Lewis gun for the observer. And the maximum payload the aircraft could carry was 260 pounds. In combat, the RE8 let some of her quality show. She was a stable platform, able to do a variety of roles from reconnaissance over to artillery spotting and bombing. And she was able to defend herself when need be. She frequently became the bane of German balloon units, which also gives credence to resilience under fire. Braving the flak day in, day out, the RE8 kept flying the most perilous of missions. And in the hand of a good crew and a coordinated flight, she was able to even keep German fighters at bay. Although these would make short work of Harry Tate in, well, most instances. You can't fault her for that, however, because, well, she simply wasn't a fighter. Over 4,000 of her were built and they saw service throughout World War I and while most were taken out of the service, they also saw some action in the Middle East for a few years following the end of the First World War. Sadly, only two survived until this very day, but luckily several have been rebuilt, like this one here, that is actually a flight-worthy example. What it was is a no-nonsense workhorse, able to execute all missions required of it without fuss or gaudiness. So, let's take a closer look. I actually found a technical note in the archives from 1918 stressing the importance of comfort in an aircraft for the crew. And it presented the RE8 as the prime negative example of how a cockpit should not be. With a chair at the wrong angle, uh, with padding areas being all wrong and limited longitudinal space and so on. Now let's see how that turns out for me. All right, so sitting in the RE8, we are greeted by a neat little instrument panel. Uh, we've got the airspeed indicator, we've got the altitude, we've got the RPMs, we've got a clock, we've got an artificial horizon, the starting magnetos to his right, and below that, we've got a nice little instrument panel that allows you to individually light the lighting for the, uh, the instruments. Um, up top, we have a fuel tank indicator right here. Uh, this is actually mirrored, so you can't really read it off by looking just like this, but if you squint down just a little bit because of that mirrored uh, reflection, you can see the, uh, the contents of the fuel tank right now. Uh, we have the backup side to his left, he'll just have to lean towards that, and we've got the main side over here, which he would use just by squinting down like this. Uh, to the pilot's right, we have a little box containing the, uh, the contents for his flare guns, or the individual flares. We also have a little basket here for wipes and these would be used to clean the windscreen once the oil starts um, you know, splashing up uh, from the engine. Um, overall the, uh, the cockpit is actually surprisingly comfortable in s to some degree. Um, my legs and my upper body have a lot of freedom. This is actually one of the most comfortable planes I've sat in for that alone. Uh, the ammo drums, uh, so the, the ammo storage that you can sort of see from coming in, in from the gun here uh, doesn't get in the way. You know, I, 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 I'm not going to hit those, even with, with, with more uh, space taking clothing. And the main fuel tank selector down there, I'm also not going in risk of hitting that by accident. What is annoying a little bit, and this is, brings us back to that note that I found in the archives, is the wicker basket that I'm sitting on. Like I said, legs, upper body room, excellent. This basket is pushing into my back quite violently. And I can definitely understand what they meant back then in, in 1918 when they wrote that note. Uh, because I cannot find a single position to sit in short of actually not sitting against the wicker basket that is comfortable. And um, yeah, so I definitely understand why, why they took this aircraft as an example of how not to design the pilot's seat. Um, behind the pilot, of course, you have the observer or gunner. He has four additional ammo drums that he can use. Uh, two to, uh, behind him, two in front of him. And then, of course, he also has a table where you can use a map. The observer uh, would also be uh, calling in uh, corrections for artillery strikes or when they were spotting uh, sort of the, the movements of enemy troops, they would, of course, make markings on the map and then report that back to headquarters. And this would all be done here. Uh, because the RE-8 was also used in a bombing role, we, of course, have a bomb site in this aircraft. And it's that little crosshair right down here, which is essentially moved together with this one right here. And you sort of have to 
lean over and drop uh, with what essentially is the Mark 1 eyeball um, and just hope that you hit what you're actually aiming for. Um, all in all, like I said, the wicker basket kind of destroys the pleasure of sitting in one of these aircraft, but overall, it is actually quite neat. Um, there, there are very little complaints here uh, beyond that. The Harris 8 was neither particularly beautiful nor outstanding, and its pilots might not fit the typical image of the flamboyant aviator. It did the jobs that weren't romanticized, and it was perfectly capable of handling this task. Never complained and operated in all manner of conditions. At the end of the day, what more could you want? Thank you very much for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon or PayPal and by sharing this video. And I want to thank the Royal Air Force Museum for allowing us to get close with their exhibit, and you can of course visit it here at their London site. As always, have a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky.